Man, what's going on? We appreciate you guys joining us tonight. Hey, the seminars are back. Coronavirus can't keep us down for very long, I nope, guess. Nope, nope, nope. We're back and we don't know what to do with our hands. We don't know what to, we're in a new spot. Like, it's weird. We're in, you got a leprechaun in the audience. <laughs> you got a leprechaun in the audience. Three generations of deans. Three generation of deans. Do they like run schools or what does that mean? Where's Boeing at? I see his truck. I don't know. I don't know. He's probably upstairs <laughs> out there waiting on us to show up in the upper room where we normally do it. He but. did go inside about 20 minutes. There you go. There's Nick Moore right there. Here we Gotta go. go. Cops, po, are here. Po. <laughs> Cops are here. No, it's great to be back doing this, man. I miss doing it and uh, getting to talk to all you guys that come. Yeah. Know we got some regular faces. Uh, and we got a lot of new faces tonight for the first time. So, man, we really appreciate you guys joining us tonight. And, uh, you know, we do these every two weeks. We'll be doing them every two weeks from now on. Uh, if they let us move them back in at some point, we'll move them back in. Be honest with you, the crowd keeps growing. Once people kind of get the hang of these being every two weeks again, we may just – Stay out here for good because we got more room. Staying out here, it's going to be hot in about three days. That's it's going to be like a hundred degrees out here in a week. Yeah, that's fair. Should point. be a hundred degrees out here today. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Ronnie's joining me, and we're going to talk about. I guess I mean it's probably what I think people want to know the most about. Like what yeah. we get the most questions about when we get to this time. <laughs> you know, the bass have been spawning. There's been a lot of spawning going on. There's still plenty of shad spawning going on. Hey guys, you can still go side fish. You can still go catch them off beds right now a little bit. Uh, brim are spawning. You can catch them, you know, relating to that brim spawn deal. Uh, there's some grass, a grass bite starting to come back. But all those different things going on, that's a beautiful thing about May is there's unlimited ways to catch them. Mm -hmm. But even with all that going on, the thing that everybody wants to know the most about it seems like every year when we get to this time of year and the fish get start to get done spawning is offshore structure fishing. Everybody wants to know how to go find offshore structure, find the fish on offshore structure, and then how do we catch them once we find them. And so we're going to try our best <laughs> with our very limited capabilities uh, to go through every step of that tonight with you guys. We're going to talk about uh, how, where to find them, how to find them, and then how to catch them. So we're going to start with where to find them. Uh, you know, there's different types of structure. now. You'll find fish on all types of structure. Like you can find fish on creek beds throughout the year. But there's different types of structure in different times of year that seem to be a little better, a little more consistent, have a little bit bigger schools or more often have the schools on them. Uh, like in the in, you know, heat of summer, those humps and those pond names really seem to kind of shine. And, and right now when we get to post pond, the first piece of structure that I look for is these very elongated, super long main lake points that run really, really far out into the lake, and then at the end of them, have some of the deepest water in the lake really close to the end of that point. Uh, that's kind of the two factors I'm looking, and I drew up a very rudimentary art project here, but got some makeshift contour lines here, and basically the depth zone that I tend to have the most success in this time of year is anywhere from 15 feet to 25 feet. So I want a very elongated flat spot running way out into the main lake that, that's from 15 to 25 feet. Now it may be from 15 to 20, it may be from 15 to 18, it may be from 20 to 25, but somewhere in that 15 to 25, those are all the types of structures. When I'm studying Navionics, when I'm studying my map on, on my GPS, on my graph and all that, the type of structures I'm looking for first this time of year, and I wanna run all these and look at all these in my electronics, are gonna be points that extend way out to the main lake, anywhere from 15 to 25 feet on that long flat spot. Uh, and you'll see the contour lines kind of contour lines on the bank and all of a sudden it'll have a big whoop that sticks out there. Well if that's in that 15 to 25 foot range that's one you need to put on your list. The other key factor and this is a big deal to me this time of year because these fish are tired. They're real tired. It's having 40 plus foot of water real close to the end of it. Out here 40 feet of water super deep. I mean that's super deep out here. So uh, these fish, these bigger fish and these schools of big fish they want to be somewhere where they can get in the deeper water easy there's no thermocline this time of year, so there's no limit to how deep they can hang out. Sometimes we'll even catch fish in 30 foot of water on some of these longer points, even deeper than 25. Uh, that's not real common, but it does happen. And kind of the deeper my flat spot is, the deeper I need this to be. So if my flat spot's 15 to 20, then 40 plus is close to the end is good. But if my deep spot is 20 to 25, man, I might need to have 50 plus out there to really have that place consistently hold fish day in, day out. Uh, one thing about these, these these fish out here on Lake Fork is they get, <laughs> with today's electronics, 
it don't take long for somebody to find them. Somebody's going to be on them. I mean, they, they get found quick out here. Uh, and so those fish are constantly pulling up on there, gathering. Somebody finds them, breaks them up, catches a few, whatever. They pull off into that deeper water. Later in the day, they'll pull back on there. They'll regather, pull back on there. Uh, so you really have to run a lot of these types of structures to find those schools. But typically, this time of year, especially in the first half of May especially, if you find a school of fish set up somewhere on this flat spot on top of this point, uh, and it's a pretty good school, pretty good size school, you can usually catch them. It's usually not, they're usually a little bit easier to catch earlier in the year. I will say it seems to get harder year after year. More people are, are learning more about deep, deep water fishing and getting out there earlier. <laughs> well, absolutely. Uh, keep going because I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna talk about the pressure and okay. these really hard to catch fish. These uh, freaking really hard to catch. <laughs> they like they fish. can be hard. This time of year traditionally is easier, but man, this year it doesn't seem like it's as easy as it has been in the past. Or at least it doesn't for me. Uh, and maybe that's because there's not as many out there. We'll talk talk more about that here in a minute. But that's the main thing I wanted to start with is where to find them. Super long main lake points. Who remembers the 2014 uh, TTBC tournament when Keith Combs broke the three day tour level record? Anybody remember that tournament that was held here? Keith Combs caught 110 pounds in three days in the month of May. Okay? And, and it was the best three days of tour level fishing they'd ever experienced. And he did that on this exact type of structure. Super long, elongated points run way out and have really deep water off the end of them. That's what he caught every fish off of in that tournament. So it's a very effective pattern. It's some of the some of the best fishing for big fish you can do out here all year to and consistently catch big fish day after day after day. <laughs> and I want to kind of add to that. So I, that's, that's uh, man, that's great information. And these long points, what I like to call bare and bald spots, are great. Yes. Especially for a guy like me and Billy. It's great because you guys wear us out when you stay hung up <laughs> in, around timber and brush piles and stuff. So we true. tend to kind of get out on those long uh, points where those fish tend to group up. Now, Let's add to that because you did mention there's a whole lot of things. Yeah. One of the biggest things this time of year, um, probably maybe the best thing that's overlooked and really tricky are creek bends. And I know, Billy, you like to fish creek bends a lot. Yep. And this time of year, what, what'll, what'll end up happening is these fish will use these creek bends just the same way they do these points. So I'm going to borrow this for a second. Yep. Let's talk yep. about this. Now, this is something I love. So I, talk, I always talk about frog fishing and that sort of deal, right? And, and I, I like the frog fish. That's not, that's not my favorite way to catch them. By, by no means is a frog my favorite way to catch them. Deep cranking um, is probably my number one favorite, but I just like to sight fish offshore. You know, Billy spends two months running around catching 80% of the daggum fish that are trying to lay their babies out here. <laughs> and he's out here plucking them, plucking them away. And he, and he sees them, and that's the, that's the excitement. For me, seeing them on electronics and turn around, if I see seven fish, and me and you turn around, we catch six or seven fish. I feel like I've done something, especially when I, I can drive over and go, those are, you know, four to seven pound fish and we catch them. So this is what I love to do. Now, these points right here are awesome. What's happened, unfortunately, um, two things. Number one, we've got a ton of vegetation. When I first started Fish Lake Fork real hard, same for Billy, we didn't have any vegetation. Yeah, we like literally, low, we yeah. didn't have any. So our schools were massive. You know, you could pull up on a school at, at 7 a.m. and there'd be 30 or 40 bass ready to chomp. Um, that doesn't happen quite as much anymore. The other thing is too, there wasn't but a handful of people that had the ability to run around with a hundred foot side scan and actually go, that's a school of fish, turn around and cast to them and catch them. Did we even have side scan? We did, did, we did. We? did. So brand new though. It helped us, yeah, <laughs> brand, brand new, but, but it but it eliminated a little bit. It's a lot easier to look on side scan and see 60 fish sitting over there. I didn't have side scan. Yeah, back yeah. I know that. I, so, <laughs> and then, the information and, and that sort of deal with the crankbaits that, that run 60 foot deep, they weren't yeah, out there. That's true. You know, the, the 8XDs, 10XDs, C20, C20, those didn't exist. Mm. I remember when Strike King came out with the 6XD, man, we were turning cartwheels. Um, those really didn't exist. Right a right lot there. of things didn't exist. What was the big one, the DD22 back then? <coughs> the DD22 yeah. was your big one. We yeah. stro I used to stroll. I mean, I had. Yeah, we had stroll. Guides tell me I was cheating. I was like, I didn't know we were in a tournament. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I want to I talk about is how these fish move on these points and some of these other areas. And so that's what's happening right now. I've talked to some guide buddies of mine, not really Billy uh, as much, but I've talked to several guide buddies of mine that are extremely, extremely good offshore anglers. And you got some, you're talking about guys that are fishing 100 and, 
150, 200 days a year out here, and a lot of that's focused on their electronics. And they're pulling up on these schools and they're really struggling. And then if they do catch one or two, the school's gone and they're, they're gone. So I'm going to tell you what happens, in, in my, my opinion. So I, we've got this awesome little point right here, okay? It kind of it comes out, and let's say right in here, there's a circle. That's your flat spot that Billy's referring to. Everybody see that? A circle in the middle, that's your flat spot. See the flat spot? We want those fish to be set up somewhere around here, right? When you start to look, you start at the tip and you yeah. kind of work your way up. We, we, everybody kind of agree with that? Most of the time when you scan a point, you scan the end of it. Okay, so there's a good chance we're all looking at the same thing. We, we shoot by at 65 to 80 foot and then we go on, okay? So let's say Billy pulls up right here and he sees some, some fish right here, okay? And he catches two of these fish, okay? And then the big old school of gizzard shad comes by and then these fish move to here. Okay, you see this? This is where these fish have moved to. They chased, Billy came over and messed them up. Then a big old school of gizzard shad came and they chased them. Now Billy's got a waypoint, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying Billy, I'm not referring to Billy really. Billy's got an awesome little waypoint right here. It's called a fish waypoint. We got different waypoints, right? We got brush waypoints, we got bridge corner waypoints, and we got fish waypoints. I saw a school over there on side scan. I scrolled over, I marked the spot, and then I left. Billy's going to have a tendency, every time he comes to fish's point, to run right to that waypoint. Yeah. Okay? Oh, yeah. That's what most guides do. That's what most anglers do. Now, this school of fish, because there's only like seven of them, because the other 50% of the bass in the population of the lake are living in the grass in the shallow timber. These seven or eight fish are over here, and Billy made two or three passes right here and can't figure out where they're at. And, he, and he's neglected this. So I'm going to tell you how I combat that. I, number one, I put my side scan on 100 feet now, and I, and I used to not do that. And what I do is I put it on 100 feet, and if I see anything that I'm not certain about, you know, I can't see real well on 100 feet like I can 60-60. Man, I can see exactly what's going on. 100 feet, sometimes I don't know if I'm looking at shad or if I'm looking at bass. But if I get, a, if I get something over there 90 feet away from my boat, I hit a waypoint, it, I circle it, and then I look at it a little bit closer. And yesterday I pulled up on school and freaking whacked like five to seven pounders, every cast. Because this school that I thought was going to be right where it was supposed to be wasn't anywhere relatively close. In fact, where they were last time was about from here to the marina from where they were this time. And if I wouldn't have saw them way over there and hit a waypoint and circled around, I would have never even known. I would have, in fact, I was leaving that, that, that ridge. And I'm, I'm talking five to seven pounders just as fast as I could get my uh, bait in the water. It's a really important thing he's talking about because, you know, we say that sometimes can be better early in the year if you get offshore early. But one thing you got to consider, guys, is uh, the water temps are in the 70s. I mean, the water temps are in the 70s, and there's no thermocline whatsoever. No. Nope. Therefore, these fish can use any part of this structure they want to. They can go as far up on it. There's nothing telling them, well, that water's hotter up there the shallower I get, so I better stay on the deepest part. There's, there's nothing telling them, I better not go too deep because there's no oxygen down there. These fish can use any part of the structure they want. So what he's talking about is very, very important, especially while the water temperature is still cool. Yeah, and so the, these fish are going to move. Now, I'm looking at a point, okay, and there's going to be certain spots on this point that are going to be better for these fish to set up. A lot of it's hard bottom. Um, uh, there could be key features. There could be brush piles. We've got a lot of, like, big block type stuff. I don't know if anybody saw the picture that I posted coming up to this seminar. I've got two red blobs beside my arches. Those red blobs are concrete blocks. I don't really know what they are. Don't really care, but they're concrete blocks and those fish are set up beside them. Um, so we're looking at this point and we understand, I think most of us kind of understand exactly what the bass are doing when they're on these points. They're roaming these points. They're using them as ambush points. Pretty similar to when we're standing at the end of a hallway and our wives coming down and we jump out and scare them. That's kind of how they use this. Now when we start talking about creek channel bends. That's a big deal. And the reason I mention that is because this time of year, we're throwing big deep diving crankbaits. We're throwing three quarter one ounce football jigs. We're throwing three quarter ounce uh, worm, shaky head worms. We're throwing flutter spoons. We're throwing big swim baits. We don't want to get in the timber a lot. I think most of us, when we go to the timber, we think Texas rig, right? Is that most of you guys, if you pull up one of these real thick points with timber, you think Texas rig. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we tend to kind of veer away from these big creek channel swings. Little Caney's full of them. You got spots in Little Caney that if we drain this lake, you could take a run and jump out of 15 foot and hit 30 because the creek swings are so deep in there. And that's something that these fish will really, really concentrate on, especially in the creeks like Big Caney or Birch, or excuse me, Little Caney or Birch Creek or something like that that have really defined creek channel swings and really defined 
um, uh, high spots on the curve. No different than what Billy talked about was fall, right? We, we, yeah, it was fall. So we, in the fall, we talked about fishing, you know, creek bends and high spots and hard spots on creek bends. Mm -hmm. and basically what Billy says, take the back of a creek, break it down. Now you're talking about four to eight foot of water. All we're talking about now is 15 to 30, 15 to 20. Doesn't have to be that big of a, a, a drop. A bass is only about nine or 10 inches tall. So you know what happens is we come by and we scan four or five points, we start to get frustrated. Now we've got a backup plan. We can start looking for creek channel swings, points. We st we're still looking for points. You know that- uh, That's what I was gonna say. If you draw a creek channel, it makes it, every one of them make a point. <laughs> yeah, so, so you're right here and you got your creek channel that goes right here. And then right here, you've got a point that comes out, okay? I'm gonna show you guys something, another spot that I got that's just awesome. So everybody sees this, right? This is my creek channel. Got my water flowing. Everybody see my creek channel? All right. Now I've got a point coming up at that creek channel. Let's think Little Caney. There's like three spots just like this. Now I've got the best of both worlds, okay? These, these fish have a great deep ledge right here. This essentially is a ledge. We don't really have ledges in East Texas. You know, when I go down to South Texas, we start to see some actual ledges. We don't really have any ledge systems until we get into our creek channel swings. Our swings are important because that's where the current cuts them off and makes them really sharp. You know, you got a soft bottom and as it comes up, anything that's gonna be on a tapered edge, any kind of any kind of tapered edge is gonna have a really hard spot on it because the hot the spot's gonna have, yeah. Um, and so that's another thing you're gonna look at. The other thing I wanna show you is when we start talking about creek bends, S bends. So we got a creek that essentially makes an S bend, right? So this is something you're not gonna see a lot of, but a lot of people will call these horseshoe bends or something like that. Everybody see this deal right here? So now what you've got is you've got several situations. You've got a spot here, you got a spot here, and you got a spot here. All three of these spots have the potential to, for bass to set up and roam. Now what you've created is you've got three spots for the bass to set up an ambush on. And Lake Fork's famous for these big schools of gizzard shed that run these creek channels. And that's, if you ask us what we're looking for, it's gonna be fish chasing gizzard shed year round. Um, yeah. Those are the ones, when you pull up on these schools and they're you know, under up to three, four pound slots, you're just not, that's not what they're doing. They're not down there gorging on big shad. You pull up on these schools at Lake Fork and every cast that you're making, the fish that comes up over four or five pounds, that's what you're starting to target. And that's what you're gonna find a lot of times in these spots. You're gonna have timber, you're gonna have all kinds of stuff, roots laid over trees in there, it's gonna get frustrating. Um, but that's the second. That's the second thing I'm looking for. I'm going points, and then I'm running straight to look at these creek channel bends. These hard creek channel bends that have got big drops to them. Some these bass can really push up and ambush on. And then I'm going to start on some other stuff like bridges, road beds. We can kind of go into that. But um, you want to talk about baits and how to? Yeah, yeah. I think we've we've done a good job of telling people how to find them, giving them some options on how to find them. Uh, let's. Tell us about tell us about the baits you're using. So when you get in these creek channel bends, because this is a this is a tricky deal, you know. Um, there are a lot of baits that that, uh, that get hung up. Um, I think a Texas rig worm is absolutely one of the very best. You know, the problem with a Texas rig worm is you're limiting yourself to fish that are that are on the bottom. You know, you, you got to drag, as we say. Um, and a lot of times those fish aren't just sitting perfectly on the bottom waiting for us to drag a worm in front of their face. So in that instance, I'll, I'll throw a few things. When, when they're on the bottom and I'm around the real thick timber, I'll throw a jig, but I don't throw a football jig where I would throw on the bald spots that Billy and I are talking about on these long points, which I think a football jig is an unbelievable bait, but I will throw more of a flipping style head, you know, more of a bullet shaped head. Um, I don't personally like an arky style jig, but a lot of people do and I think it's a great, a great bait to throw. It's bad um, to get hung up in timber though. It does, it gets hung up. That's why I like more of a, uh, just a bullet style head, you know. Well, I mean, um, we, we use two different jig brands. <laughs> but they're real similar. Well, so real which similar. Santone jig are you talking about for this? It's uh, it's just a flipping jig, which would be real similar to a six cents hybrid jig. Yeah, that's, that's the one thing I like about that hybrid jig is I, I kind of, I've gone out of where I just, even when I'm dragging something yeah. on a bald spot, I'll just use the hybrid jig for everything. Sure. But uh, yeah, they, they, they all have triangular head shapes. The good thing about both the Santone jig and the six cents hybrid jig is the head construction on jigs is so important to combine the uh, ability to be weedless and snag free, but also hook the fish in a good manner yeah. and not tend to hook them in the side of the mouth 
a lot of these jigs that are like stand-up jig heads that are really weedless, man, they, they tend to kind of roll and hook the fish in the side in the corner of the mouth a lot. Uh, and, and the one good thing that Santone and Six Sense have both done on their head designs is make it to where that jig, yeah, it's weedless. And it comes through the cover real good, but it also tends to pop them somewhere mm -hmm. in this region sure. of the mouth. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, and I think a jig's a great bait. Um, another bait I throw is a big spinner bait, like a three quarter or one ounce spinner bait. It's it tends to be a little bit. That's kind of a forgotten one, huh? You know, yeah, like that's it one is. that see, we it just is. don't talk about anymore. It used to be a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It used to be a real big deal. Uh, people. I, yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what people throw. <laughs> You're the only one I talk to. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I used to, that, well, we were talking, you said, you mentioned earlier when we both started really fishing out here a lot, about 10 years ago, whatever it was, uh, that was something that was tied on my deck every yeah. single day when I was fish, when I wasn't fishing shallow in spring or whatever, I always had a big bottom wheel or spinner back, and I couldn't tell you the last time I tied on. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Yeah. I forgot about the No, you're probably, you're bait. probably, yeah, probably so. The other thing is going to be just a swim bait, you know, and just some kind of a swim bait head. I throw several different swim bait heads. I love the Divine Underspin. Um, and one thing you guys uh, that don't know me very well um, is I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you I'm, I'm throwing something if I'm not. So I think uh, uh, the Divine Swim, the, the Underspin, that Divine Underspin is the one I'm throwing. I'm throwing that every day. I think that's a, that's a finesse bait that is unbelievable and it catches a lot of fish. And it's not, it's it's definitely not snag proof. You're gonna get you're gonna get hung. But with that that heavy head and that light hook, you can kind of get over the top of it and shake it off. Or you can, you know, just throw a small plug knocker down there because you're only talking about a half ounce or so. Um, half ounce is the biggest they make. Now I will throw like a three quarter ounce um, jig head, you know, just a swim bait jig head. The six cents makes it great when it's got the twist lock so it holds it on. With like a bigger shad, you know. Uh, like a five and a half or six inch hollow belly or some similar bait to that. Yeah, that six inch hollow belly is that when I'm throwing a deep swim bait, I'm throwing a three quarter to one ounce head typically, yeah. and I'm throwing uh, a six inch hollow belly. And that and that head comes off real easy as well if I can get over it and I can I can shake it and I can get off. You're gonna lose some stuff, unfortunately. It just it's part of it's part of fishing, but it's definitely part of offshore fishing. Um, those are kind of the main things. Now, the other thing I'll do at times, if, I, if I'm, if I know there's fish in that timber and I can't get them to bite, I might jump over the top of them with a drop shot. Um, I'm not going to do that very often. I'm not going to usually tell my man friends about it, but I will throw a drop shot on a lot of those fish. And, but I'm not really casting to them. I'm either pitching real close or vertical fishing. Um, when I move off to the bald spots, it's a lot different. The, the options are The options unlimited. become plentiful. We've got, we've got swing heads. Yeah. We've got crankbaits, of course. Yeah. We've got flutter spoons. I don't throw the swing head a whole, whole lot. I mean, I do throw it. The wobble head? The yeah, I don't head. throw it a whole, whole lot. They, I just I, really want I'm going to tell you, I throw it a lot out here. I throw it a lot. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Now, probably my number one bait that I throw out there, this time of year, I tend to lean on the jig a lot, the big three-quarter ounce, one-ounce jig. I lean on that jig a lot on them bald spots. Um, but the later in the year we get, you know, even right now I'm throwing it some, but it seems to really shine is that big shaky head. Yeah. That yeah. big stand up shaky head with that big magnum crawler, straight tail worm. I mean, that thing just catches fish, guys. I mean, you know, a shaky head's a great bait. I mean, you, you're a big shaky head guy from back in the day. I yeah. know. Oh, yeah. And so this oh, is yeah. just a giant version of that you can throw out deep. And man, it, it really, once you get to June and, and even in July and August, that big shaky head's dangerous. It catches a lot of fish for us. Absolutely. And so the options are. There's a lot of options, a lot of stuff you can throw. You got to kind of decide what to throw. And I think if you've got like a confidence bait, you know, let's say you're a Carolina rig guy, and that's your deal. And they're, they're that's kinda, why we didn't even mention that. <laughs> yeah, and they're they're tapered. There's you could kind of throw anything you want out deep, but if, if they're stacked up, you just got to know when to throw what. The other thing is, it's good to have it all tied on. You know, uh, it's good to when you when you get out there and you start fishing deep. It's kind of good to have a lot of options to throw at them. I believe. I can assure you. A lot of times these full-time guides are pulling up there, they ain't got a clue what they're gonna catch them on. They're just praying that they'll bite something in their seven or eight rod rotation. That's just kind of the mentality. Um, when the Elite Series was here last May, right? It was last May. Last May. Last May, I watched several of these guys, like Garrett Paquette was one of them. He just would, man, he would rotate through baits trying to get them to fire up, yeah. you know? And that, a lot of times you gotta do that. But I wanna talk about when to throw what based on that school of fish. 
So you're graphing the fish and they're kind of they're kind of hunkering around the bottom. What's your first thing you're gonna throw? Right now in early the mm -hmm. early part of May, a jig, a big a jig. jig. Probably same here. I'm throwing a three quarter ounce. I brought a jig. Uh, just kind of pass this around. I brought it because I'm throwing a new bait. I've always thrown a um, just like a rage crawl, but I'm throwing the stroker crawl, uh, and it's doing great. It's just a it's a good. You know what I, I really like about that stroker crawl is one of my favorite jig trailers for a lot of years that we we didn't really talk about a lot, but it was I really like that jig trailer, especially as we got to summer was uh, Yamamoto Twin Tail Grub. Oh yeah, and that stroker crawl is like yeah. a little bit beefier, kind of better version for a football jig because that Yamamoto Twin Tail Grub is kind of a finesse type of bait a little bit, and so that's a little bit beefier version, but a real similar leg style, real similar type of swimming action, and man, that that stroker crawl when I saw it, I, I immediately <coughs> said that's one of the best jig trailers I've ever seen. I mean, it's yeah, perfect same here. as a jig trailer. That's kind of I'm using it for that in a Carolina rig. That's kind of the only thing I'm really throwing it on. Uh, I know you bed fish with it a lot, but I didn't. Well, and we're catching them brim, them brim eaters around oh, the brim yeah. beds on it right now too. Yeah, it's a really good bait. That stroker yeah. crawl is a phenomenal bait. But I'll I'll start out kind of just dragging my jig, you know, and I might fish it like a jig every once in a while. I just kind of hop a little bit, and if they don't bite it, then I'll start to snap it. I'll start to stroke it, you know. Um, uh, but I'm with Billy on that. I'm throwing that a lot. The, the next thing I'm going to throw if they're on the bottom and the jig's not getting them, the very next thing I'm throwing is a crankbait. I, honest to God, I'm probably throwing a crankbait first, but Billy sounded cool by throwing the jig first, so I was going to start. Most of the time, if I pull up, and unless they're plastered way off the bottom, if I pull up, and I'm going to pass my phone around, but if I pull well, up. Well, let's, let's, let, let's, let's mention one thing here before we go further. The, the funny thing is we're sitting here saying, okay, what am I going to throw first? But what really happens is we throw three different baits first. Because let's say I got the Deans in my boat. I got father and son Dean in my boat, right? That's true. So I'm gonna throw a jig, or I'm gonna have Mr. Dean throw a jig, and Jerry Jr. is gonna throw uh, a shaky head, and I'm gonna throw a crankbait, or whatever the three baits we choose. So we're gonna pick three options right off the bat. Whoever gets the first bite, the other guy's picking up that bait too. Yeah. The second No, that's, that's right. And, uh, but yeah, so that, that is right. When they're close to the bottom, and it's within depth range. Now, I'm not slinging, I'm not going to pull up 25 foot of water and start throwing a crankbait first. I'm just not. That's going to be one of my later options because it's really hard for someone to get a crankbait 25 foot deep. Almost impossible. Hey, you got to make such a long um, cast. You got to make a long cast. You really need to, for me, when I'm when I'm fishing a crankbait, I'm, it's not, you know, I'm using my trolling motor as much as I'm using anything else. I'm, I'm making my cast and as my bait's in the air, I'm kicking it that way. I'm running this way as I'm cranking and getting her down, and then I'm once I catch up, I'm running back. I, you know, I'm my, my boat's all over the place, um, trying to get those deep crankbaits down, especially when they're over 20 foot of water. Uh, but if I pull up, and I just showed you guys a picture on the camera, but if I pull up and they're all tapered on the bottom, a football jig, a big shaky head, um, maybe me, a the Carolina wobble, rig, the, the wobble, wobble head, head uh, which is a great bait. I had to do catch a 10 pounder last year on one, uh, freaking awesome bait. Um, a Carolina rig's one that a lot of people throw. I don't tend to throw it as throw, much deep. I do. I throw it a lot. Yeah. I don't. I don't. If I do, I'll, I'll throw like. If I'm struggling, I'll start getting the chartreuse baits. I know, like the ring fry type baits. Uh, I'll start throwing there the bubble fry. I'll start throwing those type baits. Well, I'll even throw just the old, the Carolina rig bait itself, the baby brush hog. You know, I'll yeah. throw that a lot in May, especially. Uh, I'll throw a baby brush hog on a Carolina rig, and, and to me, for for me personally, you know, I like to throw that big jig out deep right now, but through May and June. If I had to give you my number one bite getter offshore, it's probably is a Carolina rig. I probably get more bites on that than I do anything else uh, in my boat. But And we're going to talk more about this later. What's, what's really cool about fishing is, for me, a Carolina rig gets a lot of bites. For Ronnie, it's probably a crankbait. It's a crankbait. And I'm going to so tell it's you, an array of things, the, 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 gets a lot of bites. The, the real truth of the matter is, is it's what you're confident in and what you spend the most time throwing is what's going to, you know, yeah. I grew up throwing a crankbait out deep when we fished, the limited time we fished deep when I was growing up, we threw a Carolina rig a lot. My dad was a big Carolina rig guy. So for <coughs> me, I've got that just built in confidence to throw that bait. You've been cranking, deep cranking since before deep cranking was cool. Yeah. And that's kind of your deal. And so for you, your confidence bait, and like you said, the first one you want to grab is a crankbait. And I think confidence is a big deal. You know, I, I do, I, I think what will tend to happen with anglers, especially uh, if they don't have a lot of confidence, is we'll, in, in fishing offshores, we'll stick with something that's not working because we have confidence. Yeah. Um, which is going to kind of go to my next uh, point. So I got the, the fish in the bottom. Carolina rig is a great bait. Uh, kind of anything you want to throw. Now, when they're off the bottom, that's where it gets tricky. Yeah. Or when they just won't bite, you know. I'm going to tell you right now. 
it's hard to catch these fish. I, I'll, I'll speak for 90% of the guides on the lake. They're not catching most of the fish they're seeing. Most of the time when these guys are out here and they're seeing groups of fish out here at Lake Fork right now, they're not catching them. And it's not, I don't think it's just Lake Fork either. I think East Texas has had, set, had such crazy weather, our fish are all scattered. The, the very end of the lake and the, the very top of the lake and the very bottom of the lake are the same water temperature. Um, it's 47 degrees every third night. So the fish are kind of off, so they're a little bit trickier to catch. And when you start seeing them off the bottom, that's when you got a few other options that are that maybe aren't as popular as a Carolina rig or a big crankbait. Yeah. One's gonna be